Okay, hello. Um, we're just, it's just all connecting now. Thank you all for joining me. I can see lots of attendees coming through. Um, I'll just give it sort of 30 more seconds. We're just having some technical problems at this end. Um, so I'm just waiting to receive um, the presentation and I will show everyone the slides for this. So I'll get going. Um, my name's Lizzie Glendening. Welcome to Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair. I'm really pleased to be presenting this talk this morning. Um, it's a very special webinar called Foiling Art Fraud and Forgery, Challenges for the 21st Century Collector. And the, um, Fred Clark and Will Corner are facilitating this and they've got a great presentation to talk to you uh, about this topic. Fred Clark specializes in art law and cultural property at the law firm Boodle Hatfield. And Boodle Hatfield have been very generous uh, sponsors of the fair and they provide a great prize called Boodle Hatfield Printmaking Prize. And you can see the 2019 winner at the fair currently, Sadie Tierney. And if you go onto the prize winners, uh, uh, prize winners tab on, um, the home screen of the fair, you can also see the Boodle Hatfield shortlist for 2020. Um, Fred's also um, on our um, panel, our panel of advisors for the fair, and he's a collector himself, so he's very invested in, um, in supporting and championing contemporary print. And Fred is joined by Will Corner. He's the manager of international art fairs at the Art Loss Register. So he has a really exciting job uh, leading the betting teams at really important art fairs such as TFA uh, and Art Basel. And together they'll be discussing how art fraud, theft and forgery can be unfortunately quite frequent within the art market, but also seeing um, talking about how collectors of all categories and budgets um, can protect themselves. So I'll hand over to Fred and Will, and I'm just going to check that I've received the presentation and I can share my screen. So if you just bear with me, um, I'll just uh, refresh this. So Fred, do you want to uh, introduce yourself? And then um, can you all see yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, Lizzie. Um, so, as Lizzie mentioned, I've been involved with the uh, fair for um, a couple of years and uh, is it working for everyone? Seems to be the, the robots seem to have taken over at this point. Um, <laughs> could, did you hear any of that from me, or was my internet just failing? It cut out, it cut out slightly. Um, maybe just start again. Um, uh, okay. they um, apologies to everyone. I think, I think we're yeah. all used to this now with lockdown and relying on internet connections. But um, thank you very much, Lizzie, for the introduction. As you mentioned, Boodle Hatfield, where I'm a solicitor, has been involved with the print fair for a couple of years. And that really stemmed from you and Jack, the co-directors of the fair, um, coming to me for uh, legal advice in relation to your gallery and also the fair many years ago, um, I actually met Jack when I bought one of his artworks. And so it's a, it's been quite a nice story. And last year, as, as um, Lizzie said, we started the Print Fair Prize and it's, that's now in its second year. And um, I've been delighted to be on the advisory board for the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair for two years. Um, I gave a talk last year and this year have teamed up with Will Corner from the Art to to give you a talk. Um, although in completely different circumstances, trying to do it virtually. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for joining up and signing in and hopefully we can um, do some, you know, deliver an interesting talk for all of you. Brilliant. And Will, um, I haven't actually received the, the presentation. Yeah, no, um, so just to uh, sort of take, uh, take over from Fred and uh, indeed and to answer Lizzie, um, we, we have prepared a bit of a presentation. Hopefully it will pop up um, at some point. Uh, um, but uh, if, if not, um, I'm sure we've got just about uh, enough info. It's basically just to try and 
keep you focused on something that wasn't our faces, but um, maybe after all this time that we've all got used to, <laughs> you, you won't be too put out for 45 minutes staring at someone you don't know. But um, uh, just to add to, to Fred, uh, Fred and Lizzie's introductions, yes, um, so my name is Will Corner. I work for the Art Loss Register, um, a database of lost and stolen art, but also other types of issues that pop up um, in the art market. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of give you a little background on, on, on art crime itself um, to perhaps uh, just put things into a bit of context, um, because of course, when we're talking about how you protect yourself and what we mean by due diligence in the art market or questions that you should be asking, these are all pretty big questions that you might think, well, how does this really apply to me? Does this apply just to old masters or just to antiquities or just to um, contemporary artworks? Uh, we have this question a lot in our work. People come to us for different reasons. If they're researching antiquities, they might uh, end up researching objects that end up on my desk um, at the ALR. Um, questions about if, could this be something that's recently come out of the Middle East or um, this is a, a Dutch old master golden age painting. Um, this is exactly the sort of things that, uh, that unfortunately did go missing in the period 1933 to 45. What can you help us to do to, to make sure that we don't inadvertently handle something dodgy? But I think the most important thing is just like any other, any other transaction that you're trying to do, just trying to bear in mind where the seller is. What, what, what kind of research has the seller actually done? Um, when you're buying something directly from an artist or from a gallery representing artist, what does that mean? Um, so to kind of go into a, a bit of background on, on that, um, I thought I'd, I'd go into to, to art crime itself and what we mean by art crime. Um, Lizzie, is that presentation popped up or should I just... Yes, it's arrived. So I'm just Perfect. downloading it. Um, and then um, I'll leave you to it and you can just tell me which slide to, to go to. Brilliant. Um, Sorry about this, everyone. This is entirely my fault. Um, my laptop has decided to pack in at exactly the right time. Normally it would be a great time, end of the day, but apparently not today. Um, but yeah, uh, so um, the reason why Fred and I put this on was, was that we thought that um, a lot of the time, um, as I said, people think that these are, these, these are questions that don't really have anything to do with them when they're going to buy a print um, at, uh, at, at an art fair. Um, and, and obviously, um, uh, what, what, is it, what does, uh, for example, due diligence mean in terms of Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair? What kind of checks do they do? They do and, uh, and why are the exhibitors there people that you can trust? Mm -hmm. These are all questions that are really important to, to any of us, especially when we really think about it. When you go to buy an iPhone from the Apple shop, you buy it probably from the Apple shop or you might buy it from apple.com. I mean, I'm currently going through buying my own new iPhone uh, or you, um, you might buy it from a, from a, a different telephone company. But there's a reason why you go to those particular places to buy those kinds of things. And there's a sort of expectation of a standard that that phone will have a good battery or that, that, that you know, that there are apps that, that, that sort of are, are known and are well known within this context. Now, it's not that dissimilar when you're buying an artwork. Um, thank you very much, Lizzie. So Lizzie's just... I'm messing up. this up. Um, no, no, that's perfect. Um, wait, so you can see these slides. Can you see I, me? Uh, I hope people can see these slides and perfect. Um, well, uh, so I need myself. Okay, perfect. and you can tell me next slide. Great. Um, so, what do we mean by art crime, and what do people normally think when they hear about art crime? Well, these are some of the more famous cases um, of stolen art in the past sort of 50, 60 years. Um, so, uh, in the top left and in the middle, you have the Isabella Stewart Gardner theft um, in Boston in 1990. You've got uh, Monk's, one of Monk's three versions of the scream uh, in the bottom left that has been stolen on multiple occasions. Um, bottom right, you have uh, Caravaggio nativity with St. Lawrence and St. Francis that was stolen in Sicily in 1969. And in the top right, you have the recovery of the lady um, with an ermine by da Vinci um, with, I believe, um, uh, 
I can't remember which, I think, I, I think it was American troops um, that recovered that um, at the end of the war uh, from a train in Silesia. Um, now, these are, these are big things that we might expect to see in movies. Uh, Lizzie, if you can hear me, let, next slide would be brilliant. Um, and quite often those movies come with lovely big storylines about lovely gentlemen thieves or that it's very glamorous or if you take the Monuments Men, that a bunch of men only with a side character of Kate Blanchett, despite the fact that Kate Blanchett's character in that is incredibly important, if not even more important than a lot of those characters depicted in the movie. Um, that is actually not really what we see. Uh, next slide, Lizzie, uh, when you can. Um, this is not just about remote gentlemen, art thieves stealing things for their collections where it's all a bit nice and all a lovely story. Art crime is crime. It is, it is something that affects a lot of us, some of us uh, more than others, but it's something that we are used to opening the papers and reading about every single day um, in London as well as anywhere else. Um, it's something that happens every day and it's carried out by people who are in the vast majority other types of criminals. It's not this lovely, dedicated, um, uh, um, sort of classy, interesting art criminal. These are things in the bottom left, for example, metal theft, uh, sculpt outdoor sculptures stolen um, to be hacked away for, for scrap metal. Uh, it's the theft of smash and grabs of jewels, jewelry and watches. It's um, the destruction of cultural heritage worldwide, let alone just in the Middle East, which is what a lot of people focus on, of course. But I think the top left is the best photograph that I can think of to describe art crime. It's something that affects normal people. And it's something that our, that our police and that our governments and that people around the world are doing their best to fight. Um, and we can all do our own bit. And that's something that because of these, the nature of these everyday items, especially when you're talking about say jewelry and watches, it is something that we can all do to make sure that we don't have any chance of inadvertently handling stolen or, or, or proceeds of crime in general. Um, next slide please, Lizzie. Um, and it's also something that's not uh, specific to, to loss and, and theft. I mean, we could have called this uh, this, this presentation basically anything uh, in terms of uh, protecting ourselves as a 21st collector. You know, art, stolen art and forgeries are perhaps the most famous, the most commonly spoken about areas. But these are these are things that um, that that span both a range of different types of crime, both criminal and civil, um, and things that span. Uh, internationally uh, and also a range of prices it's not just about you know the multi-million dollar monies that, uh, that, that 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 might be risky um, in the bottom left for example uh, you have uh, a recent case a few years ago that's still being cleaned up about opus fine art which was a, uh, a dealership in the uk that was taking loads of things on consignment from from private collectors just you know normal people for a few hundred or a few thousand pounds putting them up for sale, selling them, and they're not never passing on the proceeds to, to those people. They never receive their money. Eventually they seem to have gone bankrupt or run off with the money. It's unclear at this point, but you know, th this is something that affects you know, normal people. It's not something that's just a million miles away. And, sim and in one way, while it might not affect you because you've never consigned anything to someone, there's no reason why the, what you're being sold might not be problematic and it's just about asking questions to try and protect yourselves. Um, next slide please Lizzie. Um, and in sort of bigger cases we do uh, we do find sort of these big um, networks that might actually represent a much bigger problem or even individuals who are presenting a massive impact on the on the art market. On the left, you have um, a, a, forge, a, a, a fake, uh, sorry, a forgery. Um, the definition that we tend to go by at the Art Loss Register is that a forgery is something that is made entirely to deceive, whereas a fake is something that has been edited or, for example, had a signature added or over time has been misattributed or something like that. 
um, to, to, to say that, that the original artist is not recognized or known. Um, so in this particular uh, context, this, we would call this a forgery. Um, it is a painting created by a man called Wolfgang, Wolfgang Beltracchi, uh, who is a prolific forger of the 20th century. Uh, and this is him actually, uh, the, the painting at the top is the one that we identified at an art fair last, uh, last year. Um, it was on sale for a million euros. Um, it uh, turned out to actually be by Beltracchi. The reason why we knew that is even though a lot of his uh, fakes aren't known and he's refused to help the police track them down, um, he actually published that exact photograph in his book. So the photograph on top is the image uh, is, is the painting and the photograph below is him painting said painting. Um, on the right, uh, we have one of the biggest scandals that's come out recently in the art market. Um, that's a Basquiat Humidity 1982. It's one of Basquiat, as you probably know, is one of the best selling artists in the world right now. This one is worth anything between 10 and 20 million dollars, but don't ask me how much something is worth. It is, of course, however much um, the person is willing to pay for it. But in this particular context, you had um, a dealer who um, basically sold off different parts of the painting. He didn't uh, cut it up and scrap it, but um, he, he sold off shares within the painting. He sold off more shares than 100%. He also took an, uh, a loan against it, um, putting himself forward as the owner when he was not. Um, and basically you end up with sort of people put, investing about 20, million dollars into this painting, but in but have been completely deceived about what they've actually bought. Um, next slide, please, Lizzie. Uh, so how do you protect yourself from that? Um, and uh, so, well, one of the ways that you do it, um, and one of the reasons why uh, what's happened, I think we skipped two there, Lizzie, um, is, uh, is, um, uh, is, is, to, is that the art market has um, actually initiated the, the um, concept of the art loss register with the insurance world in 1990 to create a, a due diligence platform, a database of lost and stolen art that uh, people could submit things to be checked. So our database is not open. Um, not anyone can just pop in and have a look. We may need to do that for uh, not allowing criminals to be able to see what's been reported lost or stolen. But also, more importantly, on the art, on the on the collector side or the art market side, we want you to be able to to, to show that you've checked it. And the, the most obvious way for that to happen is that you submit the details to us. We check it against the database, and we then issue a certificate that basically demonstrates the due diligence that you or the dealer or whoever you're buying it from, because of course you can always ask them to do it, um, has had that database checked. As I said, it's not just lost and stolen things, but other types of issues um, that we're going to talk about a bit more um, in this in this uh, talk. And the database is continually growing, um, and we're always we find things every single day, and we normally have about 150 different cases ongoing at any one time. Some of those can take a few days, some will take weeks or months, um, and we basically rely on on a different uh, network of, of basically international law, national law but also contractual obligations, basically saying that if we find an issue, that there might, that, that, that person who has the object now um, should have to deal with it. So after that sort of whistle stop tour of, of art crime, um, I'm just gonna hand over, I'm gonna hand back over to Fred because I think Fred, you know, you and Boodle Hatfield, you provide a much more sort of thorough and a, a wider advisory and legal roles than we do um, in the market. Um, do you want to, to sort of summarize for a start how you guys do that at, at Boodles? Yes, please. And Lizzie, can we have the next slide, please? Thanks very much, Will. Well, absolutely, everyone. So Boodle Hatfield is a quite old law firm approaching 300 years old. And we've always advised clients who are rather wealthy, who have uh, large art collections. But um, in recent years, we've expanded the arts practice that we we have into advising on all sorts of issues in the contemporary um, art world and, and across all sorts of different sectors and so there are probably about 15 art lawyers um, of which some deal with disputes, some deal with taxation um, and like me uh, uh, others deal with contractual um, buying and selling, lending, uh, commissioning, artworks 
and we work very closely with the art loss register um, an example of of a of a case that um, or, or an example of how we work together would be for example a, a client approaches us who has spent um let's say a million pounds on a painting but uh, never received the painting and it was never delivered by the gallery they bought it from and at that point we it's a sort of detective role and trying to recover the funds that have been spent or the painting um, and the artist register as will said provide a very unique service where you can actually register a painting as being in dispute so um, in those sorts of circumstances we would advise the client to register the painting um, and simply pursue our other um, legal avenues and wait for the for the missing painting to appear again on the market um, we, we've had a recent case where this happened about six months later and I get a call from Will saying you know that painting you registered six months ago and um, it's now trying there's now a dealer in Switzerland who's trying to sell it um, and so that's a perfect example of how there is a sort of ecosystem in the arts world and um, the, the art loss register provide a you know fundamental support to lawyers and also to collectors um, where there are these sorts of issues where I get involved is more on the allocation of risks. So doing contracts, if you're buying or buying and selling or um, borrowing a piece of art, you, you'll, you'll want to make sure that the obligations on both sides are very clear. And likewise, if you're buying something and it turns out to be fake, you want to make sure that you have received contractual promises that the object is genuine um, and that you have your recourse under the contract if something does turn up to be fake. And we get involved in a broad spectrum of disputes involving art fraud and art crime so we've acted for major blue chip artists who have seen an artwork appear at a major auction house at Sotheby's or Christie's and they just don't recognize it as being a piece that they have created and, and we've we've acted to um, ensure that artworks are withdrawn from sale where the artist is disputing that they have ever created it um, we, we act for artists and um, helping them, for example, if they're, they've produced a piece of work and a, um, a large company wants to use this in an advert, we've acted for street artists where um, companies haven't licensed it effectively um, and we've, we've sought to do deals with these companies after the event to ensure that the art itself is monetized in a fair way for the artist. Um, so that, that's really a sort of background to what we do. Um, and I think we're going to move on to how these risks sort of play out in, in, in case studies. So, um, Lizzie, could you do the next slide, please? Yeah, just uh, kind of going on from there, because obviously, I mean, Fr Fred is, is much more sort of working closely with collectors and dealers and, and, and auction houses, um, very much on a sort of both a sort of daily um daily work side of things that's what he was talking about obviously on the contractual side but also dealing with problems as they come up um, for me and for, for the art loss register we are, uh, are very much working with the similar similar people um, but we're also working on the other side with um, police and museum uh, sorry police and victims of theft and insurers and so on um, so I do actually tend to see more sort of problematic objects which maybe I'm slightly biased from my view on the art world after after uh, quite a few years at the Atlas Register, but um, to sort of go into what, what actually happens and uh, when an object that's problematic comes up. I mean, because I think this is something that on the one side, people think, oh, it's, it won't ever be something that ever affects, affects me. And absolutely, that I, you know, there are plenty of people that I'm sure will go through their whole career without ever being affected by, by one of these cases. Um, on the other hand, there are certain um, dealers that I've had multiple cases with and you just have to start thinking okay it's now been three art fairs in a row and and you've had stolen objects on your stand every single one there, there might be a problem here like is there something that you might want to look at your internal processes as to, to try and avoid um, but just to give you a kind of example of that um, and what our day-to-day -day work actually um, uh, involves uh, so uh, if you have a look at this slide, um, you don't really need to see the, the particular details of it. So if, you're, if it's not too big, don't worry about it. Um, uh, so on the left, um, we have a uh, Flowers and Nuwani vase by Balthazar van der Ast, um, a Dutch old master. 
Um, and it's a painting that disappeared um, from, a, from a German museum, actually, um, during the period 1933 to 45. And that's an interesting uh, starting point in itself in that um, the objects that went missing from German museums might not be considered a, a sort of normal definition or fitting within the normal expectation of what we mean by, for example, Nazi looted art. Um, when, when we talk about that, people might be thinking more about, say, confiscations from Jewish families. Um, but there are, of course, um, these issues that at the very least people should be informed about so that if it's an object that they're looking to buy or, or sell indeed, um, that, that there might be a problem that, that is outstanding and that people are, might want to look into. In this particular context, um, the flowers and the one um, uh it was believed there are actually two versions of the artwork. Um, so when this particular painting came up for sale, um, it, which was in 2004, um, it came up actually at a, an art fair at which my 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 colleagues um, were working long time before me uh, and uh, and they identified it on sale but there were thought to be these two versions um, and they actually did a, a whole lot of research that eventually proved that there was there was only one and uh, it eventually went back to the museum but the person who had it didn't have it sort of forcibly taken from them um, they had it for 50 years I believe or rather the person they bought it from had had it for 50 years. It was just very much, uh, here's an issue, what do you want to do about it? Um, and I think that's the best thing that I can kind of say to demonstrate what happens in these particular cases is it's just settling, it's, it's talking about you know, how can we, we find the best scenario? Um, just because we're, we're sort of uh, to, to, to speed on, right? um, the earrings in the bottom, uh, at the bottom are Marina B earrings. Uh, Marina B is a member of the Bulgari family, but can't use the name Bulgari because it's trademark. Fred can probably give you far more information about that. Um, that sort of thing, those earrings come up for sale. Now, they're not particularly valuable. They are, of course, designer earrings. They are not in terms of the value or the you know, you would expect us to be talking about a stolen art. I think they were, they were about four thousand pounds. Still a lot of money, obviously, um, but they're not unique. Uh, so we we found out when they came up to sale, right? They're not. They're def they might not be unique. We had to um, research when they were last sold, um, and then try and find the original invoice that did happen to mention um, the serial number that those earrings had, C six one seven, and it turned out that of course they were the same when they looked at the earrings now. Um, bottom right, uh, we've got a whole load of watches, jewellery and other things that were seized by the, um, in Attica, um, by the Greek police um, after a tip off from, our, from our, our, our watches side, the watch register. Um, we provide a service for pawnbrokers and jewellers within five minutes where they can check serial numbers of watches to make sure they don't handle stolen watches and that actually led the police to this particular seizure. Most importantly, the top right is um, is a Spanish Farguena that was that we recovered a few years ago. But most impo most importantly, for for the work that we do, you know that that object, no one would have gone out into the world to search for that object. The way that we work is wait for those objects to come up for sale. This was a horrible theft from this old lady a few years ago, and uh, there were it, it. Yeah, I don't, I don't really want to go into the theft itself. It was not pleasant. And the fact that, that we managed to get it back, um, that photo beats any multi-million pound picture that, that we've recovered. But I just wanted to demonstrate the sort of kind of cases that we do, do come across. Um, and they are just, they, they do come up every day. But uh, I think Fred is, is probably uh, got more exciting, perhaps more, uh, more contemporary ones. Um, if you go to the next slide, Lizzie, uh, this is, these are a few cases that Fred has actually dealt with in particular um, at Poodles. Yeah, and again, in conjunction with the ALR in some of these. So um, we thought we'd try and make it relevant to the print fair and um, certainly street artists today do seek to um, produce prints and, um, and generally their reproductions of artworks that have been out on the street. Um, a couple of years ago, we were approached by Stick, the street artist who um, I hope you may have heard of or um, you may recognise these sorts of stick men that he's famous for. He's actually in the middle 
um, of the picture on the right hand side of your screen wearing the sunglasses, his sort of trademark sunglasses style. And um, we were approached by him. He had gone to northern Poland and worked with a local community group there to create this fantastic mural with some local school children. Um, it was the talk of the town and it was done on huge great big shipping containers. There were about 50 figures all holding hands. Um, you can see some of them down here in the bottom left. Um, and it was fantastic. It, it, it received worldwide press. It was seen um, to be an incredible art installation. Fast forward uh, a few years, a couple of years, and suddenly it became clear that these, um, these panels that had been chopped out of the original shipping containers were being sold on the international art market by a very well-known dealer in central London, um, a dealer called Lamberty. And what had happened was Stick had had no idea that that had happened to his artwork that he'd effectively given to the commun community. Um, did some detective work and it turned out that uh, a rather opportunist opportunistic art dealer had, had spotted a great big opportunity to go and um, break up the artwork into multiple individual pieces and put them onto the market. So quite a few of these pieces were sold um, to unwitting buyers who just walked into a Mayfair gallery and just thought, I like the look of that, you know, sort of a bit of street art in the house. And it could be a cool bit of interior design, I'm not sure, um, to have a panel of a shipping container with a stick man drawn on it. Um, and so these were originally being sold for around £12,000 a piece. So there were 50 of them in total. So you can see the scale of what this art dealer was trying to achieve. Um, so we, we were instructed, we acted on a pro bono basis. And one of the first things we did was speak to the art loss register um, and ensure that every single panel got registered on the database. So that if um, they were to come up for sale elsewhere, the, the sort of whoever was selling them would be notified that these works had been stolen in effect. Um, there were lots of interesting legal discussions to be had, one of which in, involved the artist's moral rights. So the right to not have um, your artwork subject to derogatory treatment. Um, and that would include obviously cutting it up into 50 pieces that that, that, that sort of trampled on um, sticks right as an artist and clearly the artwork was taken completely out of context um, and, and when it was broken up into mold. After some lengthy uh, negotiations, um, some, almost some very serious um, and long running legal proceedings, uh, this case settled out of hand, um, uh, sorry, out of court and um, it did get out of hand as well at times. Um, and what happened was, is the owners who had bought pieces unwittingly were persuaded to swap pieces for, um, in return for um, large scale individual prints that had been created by the artist. And so he, he, the artist did not accept that um, the dealer could sell these works. However, clearly there'd been a transaction um, involving an unwitting buyer um, and they wanted to do something about it. Um, in the end, there were discussions about the mural returning home to Gdansk. And I think, as you can see here, there are several pieces that um, include children's paint and those pieces were returned to Poland. Um, but the other pieces which were deemed, you know, would, would, would have fetched very large price, prices on the art market were actually destroyed by the artist. Um, he had just totally had enough of the legal process and just wanted to resolve it once and for all. Um, so, you know, that really does bring it into the sort of the modern world. Um, another example which uh, where there was a sort of close work with um, the Art Loss Register is the stick sculpture on the right hand side that was stolen from the Dalston um, Eastern Curve Garden. It, it was, again, a community piece of work um, and through some nimble detective work, it was eventually tracked back down and returned anonymously um, to the artist. And the last example, um, which is something that really is relevant to the print fair is um, recently Stick, who sort of is, is in some ways the modern day Robin Hood. He likes to, um, to give back to good causes and 
Um, he will only authenticate a piece that's been taken out of the street if it's being sold to fund um, a charity or a community project. And he worked closely with the Hackney Council recently to install a sculpture called Holding Hands in Hoxton Square. And this print here is a print of the sculpture of two of his stick people holding hands. Um, and he decided to create a limited run of prints. And on the day that the Hackney, um, I think the Hackney Tribune announced the sculpture um, had been installed, he put, I think, 500 prints or, or a certain number of prints in the newspapers and went out of his way to deliver them to social housing buildings within Hackney. Um, whilst doing that, many of these papers were targeted by thieves um, and were immediately going up online and being sold at you know, incredible, incredible prices. Um, and, and what has happened since is there's been a real campaign to um, for the return of these prints and, and many of them have been returned. Um, but it just goes to show you how there are sort of opportunistic people out there that um, do target particularly street artists, but um, across the spectrum, I think now online you can buy one of these prints for three or 400 pounds. Um, and it may well have been effectively stolen from its intended recipient. Um, Will and I were wondering a few days ago whether there might be some of these prints for sale at the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair, but I, I, I'm not sure there are, having now looked through it, so um, that's a good sign. But it, you, you can read about this, it, this is sort of all over Sticks Instagram at the moment, um, and it looks like we've got a comment from Rob, which may be helpful. They were a free giveaway in high volume. Well, that, that may be true, um, Rob, there, there, there were many uh, stacks of newspapers that were actually stolen from stick um, before they were able to be distributed. And it, you know, there was a, a, a run of a run of prints that were lost and then eventually returned. And um, I don't know if you if you follow stick, you can read about the story online. But um, yeah, it's quite remarkable, really. And uh, it just goes to show that the value in, in this sort of art. And Will, did you have anything to add on any of these? Uh, um, well, not particularly. I think uh, just following on from that question um, at the end, uh, absolutely, there may be certain ones that um, people decide um, and can show that they were their private property um, and that they've decided to sell. Um, that will be it's an interesting question as to how um, the potential buyer might might feel about that. Um, I think that's in general what, when I actually strip down the ALR and what we do to, to the basics. In many ways, we are just a, a notification service of, of a claim. So, for example, take your, your particular example, Fred, about the, um, the painting that was um, that turned up the Swiss private collect, uh, Swiss dealer. All we were really doing is basically providing the service by which that claim is not forgotten or it might not be restricted to the UK or just those people in the know. And I feel like, uh, for example, the, the article that, that we've cut out in that middle is, of course, from BBC, BBC News. And there's, you know, there's a push at this point to, to try and get people to know about it so that they just ask a few more questions and that they might be aware of it. And of course, if it's in two years time, then people will have forgotten entirely about this. Hopefully we'll have forgotten about the vast majority of this particular period in time. But I think that actually brings us on to the sort of last slide that we were, we, we kind of did. We, we, we wanted to kind of keep this a bit short so that you could um, ask questions that we can definitely expand uh, into both of our areas of work um, or answer questions about. But I think that, that actually brings us very nicely on to what, what advice could we suggest to people of any, um, any budget or of any type of artwork because it can protect you pretty much with whatever you're buying. Um, and the stick artists, are, the stick artworks that uh, Fred just summarized is just the perfect example of that. It's something that, okay, thankfully there's been some news about it, um, but that might not be available in future. Um, so Fred and I pop these together. Um, and I think that while, you know, it's very easy for us to say, oh, you should check uh, the artless register, you should get a lawyer to draft every one of your contracts, or you should get a lawyer involved when there might be a problem. Um, all of those are, of course, we would encourage you to do, but 
but these are questions that are going to be that these are this is advice and questions that we hope will be applicable for everyone and most importantly it's something that should change the market for for the better or at least encourage where they are going um just like you expect in any when you're buying anything else so i think the first thing we came up with is, is you know buying from reputable sources like um willish contemporary print fair there's a reason why they pick those particular dealers or they put those artworks on their website um uh remember that you are a buyer you have the power of a buyer uh you can quite often feel and fred and i have both felt it in our budding collecting careers ourselves that you're never going to find something that you like that much again um but there often is so don't feel the pressure to if things don't add up or if if you just you aren't sure even perhaps from just an aesthetic level or as 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 people say not that i do much shopping you you know you're never going to love it as much as you are going to love it in the shop so do you feel that i go with your gut of of feeling is there something off and how much and do you really love it um i think uh, fred do you want to kind of go through the rest um yeah and so particular to printmaking is editions and um you you should check what the number in the edition is um make sure you've got a number that is actually within the edition so if there's 10 prints and you're you're buying number 13 then um, it, it suggests that there might be a fake floating around. Um, I'm certain that there won't be any at the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair, but um, with editions, it, it's sort of easy to lose track of how many there are and, and perhaps some forms of artwork are easier to replicate than others. Um, we always talk about doing your due diligence. So do a bit of uh, a dig around on who it is you're, you're um, buying off, um, a bit of history about the artist. Perhaps you can find evidence that, that they have been producing work that's similar to the one that you want to buy. Um, I, I realise that many of these questions are um, avoided if you go through uh, some, somewhere like the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair, but um, many other art fairs. And one of the things that Will, um, I'm not sure, has mentioned in this is that they quite often vet um, you know, major art fairs and they go around all of the all of the individual pieces. So buyers can buy with confidence that there aren't pieces there that have um, issues with them that are fake or that um, you know may if it's a sort of an antiquity that that hasn't come from a uh, you know a conflict region in you know in, in its sort of recent recent time. Um, it's it's always worth just trying to ask a few questions and um, as, as Will said, um, don't feel the pressure. And um, if something is too good to be true, then it probably is. If, uh, if, if you can sort of use the smell test and it doesn't smell right, then um, you're probably better off looking somewhere else. Um, there's all sorts of characters in the art world um, and some dealers have good reputations for a reason. And there are lots of other people out there that um, you know do try and sort of um, ride on the coattails of, of artists. And I think, the uh, example of stick is a, is a perfect example where, um, and, and the same would happen with Banksy as well, um, you know, or any of the major street artists where pieces are stolen, um, it's effectively criminal damage, and then uh, the thieves attempt to sell them on the open market and, and generate a large windfall. Um, it, it's always worth just looking out for, for problems. Um, but you probably don't need to look too far with with Woolwich, as I've said. Um, what's on the next slide, Will? I think it's just questions. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, the other place you can't really sell a Banksy is the uh, Antiques Roadshow either, well on Rue Fit Mars. Um, but yeah, uh, we we thought we'd uh, sort of throw the, the ball out to, to any, any of you very kindly viewing, or hopefully everyone's just shut up and said, you know what, it's Monday night, it's time to relax. No, I just wanted to thank you both for the fantastic and fascinating discussion. Um, it gives us, actually, it gives us a lot of points for discussion. And I can see there's a number of questions here. And um, it's really generous of you to mention Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair as a recommended fair. Um, obviously, we, uh, in the terms of the curated exhibition, we're on the primary market. So we're representing artists directly. And a question that I had, and 
ha I hope that I'm not stealing anyone else's question, but um, in terms of artists, independent artists, especially artists at the beginning of their career, how can they um, protect themselves and also protect their potential clients in terms of forgery and fraud? Um, I mean, we work with um, Tag Smart, which is an online uh, certificate of authenticity company in terms of they they set up the platform for our open call so i mean there's an there's an option there i guess in terms of producing um getting your certificates ready is there any other advice you could give to early career artists right do you want to go first i think yeah probably... absolutely. well um i think starting early with things like certificates of authenticity is a is a fantastic idea um as, a, as an artist starting out, I think you, you really want to keep a record of what you produce, um, not least in case you, you have sort of suffer from copyright infringement or something later on. If you can show that you have a, a copy of a photograph or something of a, of a piece of art that you've produced, and if that's being used by someone else later, then you can demonstrate that you are the copyright holder. Um, it, I, I suppose that art, artists try to track where pieces go and um, where they've been sold and, and keeping an eye on their market and um, hopefully then that can feed into how they price works if they know that you know they're selling to, to good collectors through good galleries and that sort of thing um, but definitely I think I think you know being associated with um, good dealers and um, or, or if you're selling privately then um, making sure that you you know you don't uh, let the addition numbers get out of hand and you know you keep all of that carefully under control because it, otherwise it's sort of your reputation on the line um, later on. And um, we've got a really interesting point that um, I was actually thinking in terms of um, institutions myself. What are your views of reputable auction houses selling well-known artists' works but with zero provenance um, other than from a private seller but genuine in our view? um or in one's view um that they guarantee for three years um and i guess going on from that i would say and then what happens to the individuals within institutions um where you've discovered they're compliant in selling fakes or forgeries <laughs> nice big question there um uh, sorry, Brad, I'll, I'll, get, I'll take the, the provenance one. I mean, this is something that we at the Art Loss Register have been trying to bang the drum for for a, for a long time. Um, that the longer that we continue accepting that private collection with nothing else for an old master is, is an acceptable form of, of, of selling is, is, is just not it's not right. I mean, you can you can do all the checks that you can and there. And I, I utterly accept that for the vast majority of, of, of even say old masters nowadays, there just isn't, that there are so many archives around the world where maybe there would be a trace or a mention of that particular painting, but just knowing where to check is very difficult. However, that's no reason not to say, well, you know what, the painting that's come in, we're not just gonna say private collection, we're gonna say, well, we know they've at least had it for the past 40 years. Well, great, put that in the provenance. Private collection, 1970s, good start. Um, where, uh, whereabouts is the private collection? Europe, well, can we not do a little better than that? I mean, yes, I accept you're trying to keep your client uh, confidential and that's absolutely fine. And Fred, I think Fred has slightly stronger views on confidentiality than, than I do, um, but I absolutely, I. I it's something that we hope will change over time. Um, it's not something that has, it's that, that, that it's something that's always been the case. Um, actually, if you go through old auction catalogs uh, from say the 20s or 30s, certainly the 19th century or the mid 20th century, there are people were much happier about selling things from their nice country house collection that was in the catalog. Lord Ashley is selling X and Y. So I don't understand why we can't at least move towards that once more. In terms of what happens to people when they when they play, it's it I suppose I suppose the only thing that you can hope for is that as a buyer's market, people asking more questions and expecting this to be provided to them is the way this is going to change. And that's similar to the the fakes and forgeries question you, that you had about what the individuals 
you know, people can be duped and that it, it is normally fine if you're duped, but if you can show that you've done your due diligence, then, then that's got, that will protect you to at least some level. Um, so. Yeah, and there is an element with auction houses where you know you're only told the, the year and the, the the name of the piece and the artist with none of the paperwork and none of the history of previous owners or anything like that in a sort of auction world. Um, you're relying on the expertise of the specialists at the auction house to have checked that material themselves. Um, and as you say, uh, they would be guaranteeing that the property is genuine, but that's not a fail safe. And that is one of the risks of buying it at auction. Um, it happens fairly regularly that, you know, pieces that have been bought at auction are then appraised and decided to be fakes. And you would then be looking towards the, the sort of sales contract to um, recover your loss um, at, at that point. Um, but if you're relying on the specialists, you know, at the auction houses, then that's, you know, that's up to you. But certainly we would say that you should do, um, particularly if you're parting with a, a large wadge of cash, um, you should do your own due diligence on pieces. And um, if, you know, quite often you, you may find that auction houses are happy to answer questions and um, to provide more information um, if you contact them in advance of a sale, uh, rather than just relying on what's in the, the auction catalogue. Um, mm -hmm. An, an interesting part of your question is what happens when um, artists' estates or artists refuse to authenticate works. And um, that's definitely a, uh, you know, tricky problem. It, the, uh, for example, the Andy Warhol catalogue Raisonnet um, stops at a certain year. Um, any artworks that he produced after that are not in the catalogue Raisonnet. Um, and so you're only really relying on uh, exhibition history and, and other um, you know, hearsay and, and expert opinion rather than sort of hearing it from the horse's mouth. But you can identify what you know about a particular artist. And although there may not be an official authentication, then often there are experts that are willing to stick their neck on the line. And, and you know, it's not the same as, an, as a sort of direct authentication, but they would, um, that would give you some sort of comfort that you were buying a genuine artwork. Mm -hmm. um, but the world's not perfect. And um, you know, many of the artists' estates, particularly in the US, um, you know, have been sued by collectors for failing to authenticate pieces. And so now they just don't um, give any opinion because they just want to protect themselves from being sued. So it's quite a sort of sad state of affairs. And um, for anyone watching, um, in a few weeks' time, maybe a nice follow-on if you'd like to join me. Um, I'm speaking to Carolyn von Massenbeck from Bonhams. Um, auction house about the secrets of the auction house and the and the print department so could, we could like bring up some of the questions there um i don't know how much um we'd be allowed to talk about that kind of thing but um it might be an interesting follow-on um we've got uh, a question from diana have you ever dealt with fabricated pieces of evidence um such as the documentation pertaining to good titles many thanks a truly interesting talk uh, for me, um, from my point of view, uh, absolutely. Um, to take the, one of the examples that I used, Wolfgang Beltracchi, he actually uh, took, uh, old, uh, took photographs of his wife, um, pretended that it was her grandmother, I believe, um, in, in Germany um, in, the 19, in the mid 20th century. And there it was in the background of the black and white photograph. Um, and therefore look at this extra bit of evidence um, that, it's, that it's okay. Um, for antiquities, uh, it's a major issue. Um, it's actually one of the ways, for example, that we can't track down. Uh, in general, you can't record uh, on a database looted antiquities, antiquities that are taken from the ground. But we and many others have been able to identify such antiquities on sale, even unfortunately at the top of the market, because of the provenance or the documentation that accompanies it being demonstrably fake, you then start an investigation as to what did the person know? Where could this have come from? When did it come from that particular place? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we get approached by clients with title issues with artwork all the time, whether that's um, recently acting for a, um, a collector that, um, uh, sorry, a dealer who 
um, with, was buying a collection of works from somebody who claimed that they had been gifted to them by an old lady who had no relatives, um, who uh, effectively for his services as a, as a landscaper and a gardener, uh, was given a number of beautiful artworks from, from the house. Um, and, and we are then asked to then look back at the history of you know, events and to try and determine what legal basis um, the seller has, uh, whether they actually do have title to that, to, to these works. And, um, and, and you look and see whether you know, a gift would have been feasible there's no one that there's no one alive anymore to um, you know to to give, provide any evidence that it wasn't a gift or or that it was a theft. Um, so it's 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 you know terribly difficult, and the, these questions pop up all the time. Um, another example that um, where we've been involved actually again working with the Art Loss Register, uh, a, a, a client went into an antique shop and bought a fantastic artwork. Um, they didn't they, they paid 20 pounds for it or something like that went away researched it and it turned out to be an artwork by a hugely famous artist that had just ended up somehow being discarded and forgotten about and put into a sort of you know antique shop um they did a bit more research and they discovered that this artwork had been stolen about 30 years ago um and so they wanted to sell it and they came to us and said well what can i do you know i bought this in good faith um, but um, under English law, um, you can't uh, obtain good title from someone who um, didn't have that title themselves. And, you know, theoretically, the, the person who suffered the theft would have a claim against the artwork. So, um, you know, if you're selling at an auction house, you give warranties that you've got title and that you're able to sell. So, you know, we're in this case trying to find the original um, victim of the theft and that's not been possible. And so it's, the question is, where do you go from there? Um, you've got someone that's, you know, done their research and um, you know, they paid what they thought was good for an artwork and wanting to sell. But then uh, on the other hand, um, you know, you've got someone that's, that's wanting to buy, but perhaps isn't satisfied with the story. And it's, you know, it's very tricky. Thank you. And um, we have another question um, from Sarah. Do you think national and international laws and regulations do enough to assist victims of stolen art, which are more difficult to prove, for example, art stolen during World War II? Um, this obviously comes up a lot for our work. Uh, while it would be lovely to say yes, um, in general, I, I'm quite a realist, so it's, I didn't really think it's going to happen. And more importantly, you know, stolen, making special laws for stolen art, I think would be quite difficult because you're basically infringing property rights. It's, it's trying to decide where, where things should, should, should sort of happen. Um, and the differences between common law and civil law, much, much more, much better lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, but much better lawyers than I um, uh, were on a conference that I was on the other day saying you know the differences between civil law and common law are just too far apart so napoleonic code central europe um versus and uh, for example the american and uk systems are just too too far apart um i think in general uh it's it's obviously a, a very difficult issue and i think people's um people's perspectives do change quite often so for example if i give you uh, a family who uh, owned an artwork before 1940 for 50 years. It was a family heirloom. Um, they uh, have it uh, forcibly taken from them by the Nazis. Um, in 1940, the family is shipped off to Auschwitz and now there is only one person left who is claiming their possessions and now it's in the hand of an art dealer. I'm pretty sure everyone, or 99% of the people listening, will go, well, you know, that should be given back or their claim should be strongest. But if you flip it around and said there's an art dealer in the Netherlands in 1940 when the Germans invade, in that context, he sells some artworks to leave the country. Maybe he's not, he's not Jewish. He just sells it under duress. Uh, and now it's in the hands of a family who've owned it since the 1960s when these weren't questions that we all asked about. Then I think that the demographic changes in terms of how people feel about it. So I, I didn't really expect law to change, and I, I unfortunately I think it's too far away. As as great as 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 it would be for our work, it would make things a lot easier. Helen, do you have anything to add to that, Fred? 
Yeah. Well, I'd say there's a sort of moral side to it and a legal side to it. Um, the legal side is horrifically complicated because many of these artworks have travelled across many jurisdictions um, and different parts of the world and different countries have different laws on restitution of Nazi looted art. So if you've got an artwork where there's been multiple sales in different countries, you know, sometimes for very high end works, they're done in, you know, offshore and all the rest of it. And suddenly if you're an heir trying to assert a claim, it's, it's very difficult because it, it's sort of the, the waters are so muddy that um, although you may have had a right at one point, that right is quite often um, has been extinguished. Um, and if, you, if you've got a sort of seller or someone, an owner that uh, doesn't agree with, you know, the, the, the moral arguments, then um, as, you, as you see all the time in the papers, these things bubble up into horrific disputes and they go on for a long time. And uh, it, in, in many cases, the heirs are, uh, are unsuccessful in claiming back their, their sort of um, family um, heirlooms that have been lost for generations. So um, although there are many positive stories out there of, of works being um, returned, there are also many stories of, you know, large museums fighting against heirs and refusing to return pieces because they've um, worked out that, you know, for one reason or another, that the claim won't succeed. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would say the, the world, you know, however many years on from um, the, the time these artworks were stolen, it's still trying to do the right thing. But um, the further away it gets, the harder it is now for heirs. And um, although, although there are objects that are still being discovered, um, many of the artworks have either been returned or, um, you know, gifted to museums now. And um, it's becoming less and less common. Um, and people sort of seem to forget the, atro the atrocities and, um, you know, as, as time goes on. So um, in the UK, there was a, a, an end date on such claims and, and that was actually recently lifted. It was the, the sunset clause oh. um, was taken out so that heirs could continue to bring claims. Um, but in other countries, you know, the time limit is up. And um, so it just depends on where the artworks are at the time and where they've been bought and sold in the past. Um, I don't think there's any case that's the same um, now. And it's certainly not a unified uh, way of dealing with it. Yeah, I would echo that last point, especially no single case. I, I would be a bit more positive about the, um, the, the number of claims nowadays. Yes, there are many well-known claims that have now been dealt with, um, uh, but there are still so many objects, and more, more importantly, there are so many archives that are only now coming to light that show that these particular group of artworks were actually sold under duress, or this particular group of whole collection that we, none of us knew about um, was owned by this Jewish family at a particular time. So it's just incredibly difficult to say, unfortunately. Um, Thank you. Well, I find it fascinating. I'm a massive mystery fan. So um, for me, I just think it, the whole talk has been really interesting. Um, we've, so I'm going to close up um, gradually. It's been We've been over an hour. So for everyone watching, we're very grateful for you to um, for joining us. And this will this has been recorded, so it'll be online. So you're welcome to share it with people that you think might be interested. Um, we've got a couple more just to close um, on the chat. We've got um, well, we've got Rod Nelson, who's one of the artists at Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair. Um, has said that he'd like to, he has something he'd like to say. So while we wait for that, um, I'll return to a question from Rob, who's been really um, engaged through this, through this chat. So he has a, uh, an optional question for Fred. Did you hear of the case Banksy and Blur, where he sued for his artwork shown in one of their videos? Um, but they got on so well, he ended up doing their album artwork. And I'll just add to that. So I remember going to Folkestone with, uh, on a Boodle Hatfield tour of the art, artwork down there. And um, there was a really interesting talk about a Banksy um, art, a street artwork that had been chiseled out and sold separately. Um, so I guess there's a whole thing about who owns street art and I don't want to, I, I guess it's a long thing to go into but if it is caught on camera in the background so you know an artist has put work on the wall and someone 
is filming in that street, um, who is it okay to, to show that work publicly? Um, well, it, it depends really, but um, you know, copyright exists in street, in street art, even if that is illegal street art. Um, and, you know, although that's not written down in, in the law, uh, there's, there's been cases where judges have um, sort of determined that, you know, that, that that would be the case. So um, if you reproduce someone else's artwork in, you know, substantial parts of it, then uh, you may well be breaching their copyright and, you know, they may have a claim against you for breach of license. But um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tricky area and, a, and an evolving area of law. Um, and R Rob asks if I've sort of heard of the Banksy and Blur um, debacle, and I haven't seen that, but I have, I am aware that Banksy, um, until recently, hasn't ever tried to assert his legal rights. And that is partly because if you want to um, bring a claim against someone, you have to do it in your own name. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's all sorts of knockoff Banksy t-shirts you can go and buy in, you know, Camden Market or wherever it is, um, obviously not at the moment, but, um, you know, and these street artists have just have their copyright uh, abused day in, day out. Um, I, I believe that there was a case very recently where Banksy was actually finally trying to assert copyright, but in an anonymous way, uh, and it was thrown out of court by the judge who said, you can't, you can't do this because you haven't, if you're going to bring a claim, you're going to have to give up your anonymity, um, which is obviously a huge part of his image. And I, I believe he hasn't come forward in a, you know, bring a case in his name. But um, yeah, it's a very, very tricky area. Well, um, thank you so much for, for um, both of you, Will and Fred, for joining us this evening and dedicating your time and expertise. It's really, really fascinating. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, do email me and I can forward them to both Will and Fred and hopefully you'll have um, an answer soon. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope that you all have a really interesting evening and if you're going on to the Woolwich Contemporary, uh, the online edition, I hope you can look at things in a new light or you, you know, um, go and visit some of our um, exhibiting galleries and, and, and learn about the artists and, you know, support emerging artists. Cause these are struggle, you know, these are struggles about sort of identity and things that will come up for them now and again. And, um, so anyway, um, thank you both for joining us and I'm gonna sign off, <laughs> okay? Thanks Lizzie. Well, I hope the rest of the fair goes well and the, the program continues to be um, a great, great success and um, no doubt we'll catch up after all of this is over. Brilliant. And we've had some really lovely comments. So I'll forward those to you. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining.